You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 422, Paul's use of the Old Testament series, Romans 12 through 16, with Dr. Matt Halstead. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? I'm I'm able to listen to baseball just most of the day, Trey, so I'm I'm hanging in there. Well, that's good. Believe it or believe it or not, that's a big part of my day. I just like to have it on and so I can be productive and you know, have have my mind thinking good thoughts. Yeah, do you enjoy going to the games? Yeah, I do. Yeah, have you ever gone to spring training or anything like that? I have not. That that was one of those things I I've been wishing for years to do it and you know, planning, you know, I say planning, but thinking about it, but I never actually pulled the trigger on it. Yeah. Does um Calvin or anybody in your family do they enjoy baseball or are you the only one? No, I'm I'm the only one. So I I it's something I'd either do with my brother ah, or yeah. by myself or get get together a small group of friends to do it. Oh yeah, you got to do it with friends. You, you got to. That's where you get crazy, let loose. I can only see Mike out there getting crazy. <laughs> Did you ever see that Jimmy Fallon movie um, with the, about the Red Sox? He was a a diehard Red no, Sox uh, fan with him and. Um, no. Oh my gosh, it's so good, Mike. You need to see it. Uh, you would love it. But uh, he he kind of does. Well, I'm that a Red Sox friends. fan, so I probably would. Yeah, yeah, you would love it. Just Google Jimmy Fallon. Well, it should be movie. hard to find. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, I I think of you when I see it now because uh, it's it's that good. So it is worth looking into. <laughs> but all right, Mike. Well, here we are. This is the last installment of Paul's use of the Old Testament, and we're wrapping up in Romans and. Uh, yeah, yeah, it took a while to get here, but again, I think I think this will be one of those series that was really worth doing. And as you know, the the more people uh, get into it, and again, we hopefully this isn't that doesn't apply to anybody listening now. But don't just jump into the last episode here. You got to got to listen to all of these in order to get the most out of it. I think as people do that, it'll it'll prove to be a valuable series. Oh, absolutely. Surely none of our listeners buy a book and turn to the last page and read the last page. That's, yeah, not, I know. that's not our listeners. So I don't think we have to worry about that. Yeah. But <laughs> Well, we're grateful to have Matt Halstead back with us at least one more time for this series anyway. Matt, I think this is our 12th uh, segment here in our series on what Paul does with the Old Testament and Romans. So... I think this has been a good series. I think it's an important series. So I'm hoping that most of our audience is sort of caught, you know, hopefully by this time, because here we are at the last one, you know, what, what we're trying to do here and flesh out the, you know, starting with the messianic portrait and how Paul reconfigures certain things in the Old Testament in light of his own experience of Jesus and, and how that has a direct impact on the way he reads the Old Testament, but the way he reads the Old Testament isn't out of step with the way other Jews could have and did read it. They just didn't have they didn't have that capstone information about Jesus, whereas Paul did. Right. Yeah. And and that for Paul is definitive, right? I mean, it, it offers a sort of retrospective understanding of the Scripture and, uh, it, namely, his Christology or his Messianism. I guess it's you could 2020 say. Twenty twenty hindsight. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and of course, the minute you go there, the minute you say something like that is the minute yep. you you open yourself up to, okay, how do I defend Paul from doing something like radically new in in a way that's divorced from the Old Testament story? And yeah, and and hopefully in this series we've we've talked about how Paul can can really do both, and that they're mutually they're not mutually exclusive. Like Paul can interpret things fresh, but that's in line with the Old Testament story because the Old Testament story anticipated this sort of thing. So, and I know in, in, you, in, in your book, in your academic writing, I mean, you, you go into a lot of Second Temple material that we, we haven't been landing on, at least as far as the series, you know, for the most part anyway. But, you know, the audience should know that 
you know, a lot of these a lot of these trajectories have histories in the Second Temple literature. It's it's not all brand new. Yeah, that's an important point. And that, that was one thing I discovered when I did my Ph.D. is by looking into the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, particularly the Pesherim, which are the commentaries, the Jewish commentaries that um, were produced and that are that are part of the Dead Sea Scroll material. When I looked at those uh, commentaries, I I pointed out there were, you know, in ter- well, in terms of approach to scripture, Paul and the Pesherist or the, the Jewish commentator, you know, they, they were operating on the same plane. They, they interpret scripture in light of their own uh, situation, their own circumstances and so forth. And, and when I, when I read through those Dead Sea Scrolls, um, you know, line by line, uh, reading through the Pesherim, I, I went back to Paul and I began to notice that, my goodness, you know, he's doing, you know, he's doing different things than the Pesherist is doing, but he's also doing something quite uh, similar at the same time. So I wanted to isolate, okay, what's similar and what's different. And really what I found is that, you know, this is a very generalistic way of putting it, but what was primarily different for Paul was that his Christology, his belief about this Jesus of Nazareth person really impacted the way that he read scripture. And, and, and you know, even some of the same scriptures that the Pesherist was looking at, I'm thinking of like Habakkuk 2, yeah. verse 4, right? So that's a well-known one. So Anyway, um, so in my project, I I wanted to I wanted to tease out this whole Christological element in Paul, and and then when I wrote my book uh, a few years later, I expanded my dissertation to not just look at a few passages, a few chapters in Romans, but to actually look at the entirety of Romans from chapter one all the way to the very end. And what I found was that that Paul is pretty consistent in the way he interprets Scripture throughout the entire book. And, and so, so, um, essentially my book is an expansion on my dissertation. And what's the, what's the title of the book again for our audience? Yeah. Paul and the meaning of scripture. And it should be out. I don't, I, I'm guessing in a couple months or, or in a month or so. No, um, that's good. yeah. And, and the book is sort of, it's sort of interdisciplinary at the same time because I, I employed, I owe oh, some insights from an old, a uh, German philosopher and who, who had done a lot of work on hermeneutic theory. And so I, I, I got into obviously Paul and his Jewish context quite a bit, but I also wanted to show that what Paul was doing was, is hermeneutically viable. Like it, it can be philosophically justified. And so I, I, I brought in this uh, philosopher named Hans Gord Gadamer and, uh, and, and used his method uh, or, and really, it's not a method, but his insights into hermeneutic theory to show that that um, you know, look, uh, Paul was not uh, an interpretive quack. <laughs> you know, Paul right. Paul was doing some serious stuff. Or a hermeneutical hack. Is all That's I can right. Say. That's right. And and for my project, when I when I used Gadamer's hermeneutic theory, it, it was very appropriate to do that. I think because Gadamer's hermeneutic theory was basically a, a critique of enlightenment hermeneutic uh, principles in a sense, right? You know, um, and oftentimes that's what happens with Paul or any second temple or Jewish interpreter is we high and mighty 21st century Americans who live in a post enlightenment idea of hermeneutics, you know, we, we critique Paul in light of our assumptions. And so what Gadamer has done is say, you know what, The, the enlightenment itself, our modern hermeneutic methods, they're they're not what what they were cracked up to be, or, and maybe we need to reevaluate. So anyway, that's that's an, that's another conversation. But so my my approach was sort of interdisciplinary. It was biblical studies with quite a bit of uh, hermeneutic theory uh, as well. So what do we want to cover today? We're in our last installment. So we have Romans twelve through sixteen, the left, which you know as is typical of Paul. He he lays lays you know heavy doctrine on us and then he'll he'll shift gears to what he sees as practical ramifications so is is that the is that what we're going to do today yeah that's that's right and um we we divided romans up into uh, essentially four parts four sections and it's in romans is pretty easy to do in that regard and so um what we did in in you know the last three episodes was look at Romans 1 to 3, 
where Paul focuses in on concepts like faith and Torah, Torah keeping and that sort of thing. And we, we saw how Paul reconfigured those concepts around his belief that Jesus is Messiah. In other words, around his Christology. And then, um, we looked at in, in, a, in a, the, the episode after that, we looked at Romans chapters four through eight, where in those chapters, Paul Christologically reconfigures Jewish stories. And we, we looked at the, the Abraham story in, in chapter four. But, you know, there, there are other stories that Paul deals with, you know, the Adam story in chapter five and, and arguably the story of the Exodus in chapter six, seven and eight. Um, and I think Paul takes those stories and gives them uh, a fresh interpretation in light of his Christology, but nonetheless, one that is consistent with uh, his his understanding of, of the of the original Jewish story itself. And then and then finally, the last episode, we we looked at Romans nine through eleven, and that was important to do because what what Paul showed us was that the people of God have been you know, Christologically reconfigured, right? In other words, the the the, the election of God's people, um, an election itself. You know, how does God have a people it, and all of that is is reconfigured around Christ in, in Christology. So so we've we've now come to the last part of Romans, Romans 12 through 16, where, as you mentioned, Paul sort of shifts focus away from what we would call, you know, doctrinal stuff, justification stuff, righteousness stuff. And he moves on toward uh, ethics and, and discussions about how we should live as Christ people. And, and, and I and I want to argue that even here, Paul um, understands Christian ethics in light of in light of Christology, in light of Christ, and and um, he reconfigures the way we ought to live, and and that has impacts on how we should interpret Torah and certain laws, such as dietary laws and Torah. That's what we're going to focus on today. And of course, it's important for us to realize that those first eight episodes that we did in this series were important for understanding Romans because we spent a lot of time going through the story of the Old Testament and outlining the messianic profile that we found there. And that was, that was super important because if we don't have that as our basis, then, then when we come to the New Testament, like Romans, we're going to see Paul do things that seem so disjointed and out of, uh, out of line with what we might expect. But again, that messianic profile was super important in this regard. And so, you know, again, if, if somebody's listening to this episode, uh, without having listened to those other episodes, it's it, it's not going to make a, as best sense as it possibly could. But anyway, uh, so yeah, that, Mike, that that's where we're headed with Romans twelve through sixteen. Yeah, well, it, it's it's sort of inevitable because you, here you have a circumcision neutral body, you know, the, the church, and you know, ultimately, Paul isn't isn't just writing to an exclusively Jewish audience anyway. So he's going to have to circle, you know, circle back here and apply what he's, you know, what he's been talking about. Right. Yeah. And and that's an important point, too, is to consider his audience, because the Roman church would have been a mixed group of, of Christians, Jew and Gentile. That's why he's spending a lot of time talking about how does, you know, how does justification work? What does it mean to be in covenant with God? And and, and, and that's a, that's an important question. That's a very practical question. Because Jews and Gentiles are going to have to figure out, okay, when we sit down to eat a meal, like, A, what are we going to eat? And B, what are we going to do when we disagree? <laughs> you know, and, um, and th- that's what, that's what, that's why Paul's theology is like super practical. We, we do have a tendency to, you know, separate Paul's theology or doctrine, whatever you want to call it from his ethics. Right. And, and, and really we, we shouldn't do that because, because it, it's all one big stream of thought, uh, for Paul. And I think we see how all that comes together by, you know, doing the thing that we're doing in this series is asking the question of hermeneutics. And what we see is Paul's Christological hermeneutics is sort of the thread that unites everything together, I think. And and we'll, we'll see that again today um, when we talk about Romans 14 uh, and, and the way Paul envisions this community of believers and how they ought to act with one another. Well, I, I imagine you want to jump right in at chapter 12 with the sacrificial language. Yeah, that, that, that's right. So let's do that. Let, let's let's look at Romans chapter twelve, uh, verses one to two, because the, you, you're right. The, the language of sacrifice is there, and you know we would read this and just kind of glaze over it, let our eyes just 
pass over it without thinking much about it. But I want to suggest that we don't do that because the word sacrifice, you know, as a concept, an Old Testament concept is very important. And so let's let's read Romans 12, 1 to 2. This is from the English Standard Version. Uh, here's what Paul says. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay, so when I read that, there were lots of words like you or your. And in the English translation, you don't you, you don't really get the, the fact that in, in Greek, um, those words are actually in the plural. OK, so what, I, what I'd like to do is, is read a translation that I that I wrote and, uh, and you'll you'll get you'll get a sense more of what Paul's actually saying, because he's, he's addressing the entire group of Christians here. So let me let me reread it this time. This is my translation from the Greek. He says this, brothers and sisters, I encourage you all through the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living, sac- living sacrifice, sacrifice there is in the singular. It's holy and acceptable to God, which is the reasonable act of worship for you all. And do not let yourselves be conformed to this age, but let yourselves be transformed by the renewal of the mind, singular, the mind, so that you all can discern what the good and pleasing and complete will of God is. So, you know, what's really interesting there is you have this mix of uh, a plural and singular here. Um, that I think that that really need to to be brought out more than than the English Standard Version really shows, right? So so what so w- why is this important? Well, because he he encourages everybody, all of the, the 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 different Christians at Rome, the Jews, the Gentiles, just all all the people, to come together as a singular living sacrifice and to have a singular new renewed mind. Um, so that together they all can have uh, a better idea of what God's will is for their church, for their lives as Christians. And so you have you have this sort of play that, yeah, there's a many uh, in the church, there's many different people in the church, but there's actually, in God's eye at least, one singular sacrifice. Now, now that, that's that's very important because, you know, as a church that has many Gentiles in it, you know, he, he, Paul is transferring Old Testament language of sacrifice to even, not just the Jews, but even to the Gentile population in the church. And, and, you know, if we take into account all the other stuff Paul says in Romans, like Romans chapter two, where Paul says that circumcision isn't even required anymore for Gentiles. And yet he still sees these uncircumcised Gentiles as pleasing sacrifices and, and, and actually being part of the greater covenant community. He sees these Gentiles as, as being fully included, such that they themselves can be seen as part of the one singular sacrifice, the one people of God. Okay, so that's very important. To kind of to kind of press the point even further, let's look at that word sacrifice. Here Paul uses the word thusia, thusia, and it's it's an important word. In the Old Testament, places like Leviticus chapter one, Leviticus chapter uh, chapter two. We we get some descriptions about like burnt offerings and grain offerings and so forth, and in in the Greek Old Testament that word thusia is used there. So let me just read Leviticus chapter one verse nine. This this comes from the Lexham English Septuagint. It says this, and they will wash its internal organs and its feet with water, and the priest will place everything upon the altar. It is a burnt offering, a sacrifice, a thusia, a sweet smelling odor to the Lord. And the same word is applied to the grain offerings of chapter 2. So Leviticus chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And when a person presents an offering as a sacrifice, as a thusia, to the Lord, his offering will be the finest flour, and he will pour olive oil upon it, and he will place frankincense upon it. It is a thusia, a sacrifice. Now, this gives us, English speakers, more of a sense of, you know, the, the radical nature of what Paul's doing here in, in uh, Romans 12, where he he's calling Gentiles sacrifices, thusia. And, and what, what Paul's really doing, what's going on in the back of his mind is that the Gentiles are, are completing or fulfilling the law, the Torah, the Torah. And again, the, the idea is that they're doing this as people who are uncircumcised. And, and then again, R- Romans 12 
needs to be interpreted in light of Romans 2 and 3, where Paul says circumcision of the heart is what matters, not circumcision of the flesh. And moreover, that according to Romans 3, that that Christians fulfill the law. We complete the law. Romans 10, 4 says that um, that in Christ, that Christ is the telos of the law. In, in other words, he's the culmination of the entire law. So everybody who is in Christ, Jew and Gentile, they, by default of being in Christ, fulfill the law. And it, it's an easy, easy uh, thing to say after that, that, you know, we are the sacrifices. We we embody everything that the sacrificial uh, desired. Um, not Not because we, there's anything special about us, but because we are in Christ in whom uh, the sacrifice was made in, in, you know, in his body. Well, you, you would think this, this, you know, to put it mildly, you would think this is going to cause offense <laughs> to somebody. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah, this is, this is not, uh, something that would allow Paul to make too many friends, <laughs> right? I mean, they're, they're, um, they're still going to, they're still going to be worshiping the, you know, what 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 comes to my mind is is that you have this um even today you have you have congregations that want to incorporate more jewish stuff okay more messianic you know the, like messianic congregations and that there's certainly a spectrum there I, I don't think that this this cuts that off you know i don't i don't think that you know an individual local church today needs needs to be worried about how much of that they do, but they need to still realize what the theology is behind it. You know, so that we don't we don't end up creating, you know, recreating divisions among us. Mm-hmm. Whereas Paul is trying to get everybody, you know, it's everybody on the same page essentially. Right, right. Yeah, we never want the assumption to be, okay, let's let's include more Jewish elements in our worship services because that's the better thing to do. Right. Or or anybody who doesn't do that is somehow right. not following scripture or anything, right? Um, yeah, it's an occasion for judgment. And he's I don't want to I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because Paul's going to get into some of that in Romans 14. But yeah, that's the idea. Right, right. Yeah, and and um, you know, I mentioned a moment ago that that Paul envisions this diverse community um, as being one collective sacrifice, one Thusia. And he he gives us the logic later in Romans 12, just a few verses down in verse five, you know, he talks about this community as being one body in Christ. Um, he also talks a lot about this in Corinthians, first Corinthians, and how we are as Christians, we are the body of Christ. And and that that really carries the logic because, you know, as Christians, we believe that Jesus's body is the place of sacrifice. And if we are, you know, united to Christ and, and, and we embody him, then it makes sense that we we too would be called sacrifices. And, and that's all, that's what, that's the logic that Paul is using here. Um, but, but the point I want to make is that Paul is reconfiguring this community, these believers around his Christology, around the Messiah. And so, you know, in terms of hermeneutics, this isn't, this is an important thing because Paul is, Paul is really asking the Gentiles and the Jews in this church to, to reinterpret themselves. Uh, he, you know, because there might be division in the church, you know, there are some who might look down on their Gentile friends for not being circumcised. And there might be Gentiles who look down upon their Jewish friends for, you know, maintaining dietary laws or something. And Paul wants to, Paul is asking them to take a step back, take a deep breath and say, okay, let's, let's offer a new interpretation of our community. Let's Let's put on some Jesus lenses and look at each other through the Jesus perspective. And what do we see? And he's he's saying, look, we see one body, we see one collective sacrifice. And so really Paul's ethics is is grounded in his hermeneutics. I mean, that, that might be controversial to say, but but it I think something like that is the truth. He he has such a thoroughgoing Christological hermeneutic that he thinks it should impact the way we treat one another. And, and that's what we're seeing. And, and, and so that's why this is important. I mean, at first glance, like all of this kind of appears to be of very little significance, right? But, but in fact, it kind of gives us a preview into how Paul is interpreting things in light of his Christology. He, for, he interprets Thusia, sacrifice, 
in light of his Christology. He's interpreting this people in light of Christology. And, 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 you know, when we, when we recall some of our episodes, particularly the Malachi episode that we did, which I, I still find myself thinking, thinking about because I, um, I just think Malachi is a, the perfect introduction to Romans. But anyway, you know, we were, yeah, I would, I would agree. I think about that one a lot too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, thinking of it really since we've, we've re-recorded that episode. And as you and I were, were preparing for it and thinking through it, I, some of the things that we, we discussed, I hadn't really considered that much before. And, and so it's it's something I, I'm still musing on. But but let's just re- remember what Malachi said. He accuses the Jewish priestly system of being corrupt and not being able to fulfill their vocation as priests. You know, he says something like, you know, as priests, you should guard knowledge, but you're you're actually <laughs> leading people astray. And so they have um, they've 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 been unfaithful to their vocation. And and yet Malachi also reaffirms Israel's election at the same time that, you know, I have loved Jacob. I have set my love, my covenant love on Jacob. And and the name of uh, the name of Yahweh will be spread throughout the whole world. You know, that kind of language. And and, you know, we, we asked ourselves in that episode, well, my goodness, you know, how does Malachi envision that 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 Yahweh's name would be great in the earth and that Israel can still maintain the, her elect status and yet Israel be a complete failure in, in her rebellion. How does that happen? Well, that's where um, Malachi's Messiah or messenger came into the came into play because when we looked at that passage, Malachi was very, very, very clear. He said that essentially that the, the messenger, the Messiah, would um, purify the offers, offerings and the sacrifices. And uh, that he would, in a sense, um, reconfigure the whole priestly system around himself. And that's how the program of Israel being the rescue plan for the world would would continue. And and, you know, with that in the background, we come to Paul here and he's doing much the same thing. He is saying that the sacrifices, the sacrificial system is indeed continuing. It's going on. It's going strong through the Messiah people. And, and it really makes you wonder, okay, you know, was Paul reading Malachi? <laughs> and uh, more than likely, yes, he, he knew the story. Yeah, chances are high. Right, right. Here's the real question is, you know, are we reading Malachi? I mean, we read Paul, but do we read Malachi? You know, and if we don't, then what Paul's doing here really loses its depth uh, and its, its, its beauty, if you will. Yeah. So anyway, so the point that I'm making here is that Paul is interpreting the community and he is interpreting, once again, a Jewish concept of thusia, sacrifice, around the Messianic figure. Malachi said this would happen. Paul's doing it. Makes perfect sense. Now, let's let's kind of shift gears here, because that that observation we just made can lead us into uh, yet again into, into seeing how Paul can interpret text from scripture Christologically as well. And so, so one thing I want to say, I just want to emphasize this before we get into it. Um, Paul's Christological interpretations, um, they, 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 they are not at odds at all with that messianic profile that we've documented throughout the Old Testament. And I think if we were to read Paul in light, uh, well, let me back up. If we fail to read Paul in light of that messianic profile that we've talked about, then 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 Paul's going to appear to be doing something completely strange, very odd and in, enigmatic. Right. But when we take the, the messianic profile into account, you know, the writings of Malachi, for example, then then Paul's hermeneutic begins to make a lot more sense. Um, so we can say, yes, on the one hand, that Paul's interpretations are fresh. They are new. But we must also say that the Old Testament story, the narrative, it anticipated all that Paul is doing at the same time. So that's something to consider. Um, okay, enough of all that. So let's let's just look once again at another example from uh, this last part of Romans, where Paul takes an Old Testament scriptural text and interprets it Christologically. I, I think Romans 15 uh, verse 3 is a good, good text to look at, because there he's going to quote from Psalm uh, 69. Uh, verse nine. So let me give, let me give some people some background on all of this first. 
what is what is Paul doing? Um, well, basically, what Paul wants is all of the Christians at the Roman Church, Jew and Gentile, to be united uh, in love for one another. Right? He doesn't want divisions or anything of the sort. Now, now specifically here, Paul's going to talk about dietary uh, dietary laws and food convictions and all of that, because. Among Jews and Gentiles, there's major disagreement about this sort of thing. And there's a lot of disunity with respect to those those dietary laws. But what he's going to say is that all Christians, no matter their conviction on this, that, we, that, that they should be gracious, they should be loving toward all of their fellow believers, even when they disagree with them. And, and this, is, this is a point of contention here, but we need to note it, is that Paul does not think Christian unity should be configured around dietary laws, even dietary laws prescribed in Torah. And as you mentioned, this would draw the ire of many of his Jewish friends, of course. But Paul is going to push back and say, no, 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 there's freedom in Christ. Um, and, and this is okay to do. But, and this is important, Paul does not think that Christians should use their freedom in such a way to make their brothers and their sisters stumble. So out of love, inspired by Christ, They should kindly abstain from those actions that would prove unnecessarily offensive to uh, their brothers and sisters. So what I want to do is look at uh, Romans 14, 1 to 3, just to sort of uh, get get a taste of that context. So Paul says, Romans 14, 1 to 3, this is from the English Standard Version. Paul says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. And and, and so, for Paul, this is the new way of living. This is the new ethic that Paul envisions, that believers should not feel as if they are wrong for not abiding by the dietary laws. Uh, but they should also temper their freedom with love toward those who who simply have a different opinion. In other words, Jews and Gentiles should get along. <laughs> they they shouldn't pass judgment on each on each other in this regard. And so, in order to illustrate like what that's going to look like, in order to illustrate that type of love and deferment to your brother and sister, what Paul's going to do uh, later is he's going to prop up Jesus as that supreme ethical example of someone who loves well. Okay. Now, this is where in Romans 15, verses 1 to 3, where Paul is going to quote a passage from the psalm, Psalms, Psalm 69, verse 9, and he's going to interpret that psalm Christologically. Okay, so so let me read that. This is Romans 15, 1 to 3 from the from the English Standard Version. Paul says, he says, quote, we uh, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written in Psalm 69, verse 9, quote, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So that's the line from Psalm 69. The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Okay, so like what in the world is Paul doing here? Um, So again, Paul takes this psalm, which was originally written by David. And he interprets it as a prayer of Jesus himself, as if Jesus actually said those words. So, in other words, David's voice is transformed into the voice of Christ. Now, again, what are what are Paul's motives for doing that? Well, the motives are he, he's he's admonishing the strong believers, uh, those who um, who feel like they don't have to abide by the by the dietary laws. He's saying to them to bear up with their weaker brothers and sisters, those who who think they need to abide by the dietary laws. And and he wants the weaker Christians to bear with the freedom that these other Christians have. Okay. And and so in that sense, both sides, I think, are are meant to carry the burdens of the other. That's what the overall context suggests, that both sides need to be patient with one another. And and Paul wants the Roman church to see how Jesus is a model of that kind of burden-bearing, patient love, someone who can carry the reproaches and, and do so with grace. Okay. That's easy enough, but but here's here's something I want to point out. It's a it's a bit of an enigma, enigma, or something that that's sort of hard to understand at first glance. So if you go back in the original context of Psalm 69, you'll see that this isn't this is a prayer uh, 
that is a plea for God to save David, who, you know, apparently was experiencing some sort of difficulty, some trauma of some sort. And so he's crying out to God, uh, crying out to God for help. Now, initially, it, it would seem difficult to apply that entire text to Jesus. So, for example, in verse 5 of Psalm 69, David says this. He says, Oh God, you know my folly. You know the wrongs that I have done. Uh, they are not hidden from you. So, so the question here is, you know, how can Paul legitimately interpret this text Christologically? Because if you go back and read the context, the person talking, who, you know, apparently Paul wants that to be Jesus, the person talking admits to being sinful and doing wrongs and being foolish. So how, how could that be Jesus? You know, we know Jesus to be perfect. Um, so, so just, just sort of a, a, a rule of thumb. This is what I do when I read my Bible. I always ask questions. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be afraid of hard questions. You know, what in the world is Paul doing here? And, and I, I think the Bible can handle those sorts of questions. And so I just ask them and, and see where they lead me. Um, so I encourage everybody. This is, yeah. this is almost like the situation you get into with parables. You know, mm -hmm. is, is it legitimate to press a parable? You know, is a parable trying to make one point or 20? You know, yeah. like pressing all the details into service. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's definitely something to consider here too. And, um, as I, as I think about this, you know, I come up with a couple of options that we can do and, um, and one of them is just don't press it. Don't, don't make it do more than what it's intended to do. Maybe Paul yeah, doesn't Paul, want, you know. Right. Maybe Paul had something specific in mind as opposed to every last detail in mind. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's very possible. And, and, and of course, now, now the next question would be, okay, if that's the case, if Paul's picking and choosing, what gives him the right to pick and choose, right? How, how, how would that work? What I want to suggest is that there's a logic to his picking and choosing, if indeed that's that's what he's doing. If he's just picking and choosing this one verse to be the voice of Jesus, and he doesn't want to apply all those other verses as the voice of Jesus, then what gives him the hermeneutical right to do that? Now, it, it could be that he is picking and choosing. And, and I want to say, if so, I want to propose a logical answer to that. But it might also be that he's not picking and choosing. Let's just say maybe he wants all of the Psalms or all of the verses in that Psalm to apply to Jesus. How, how would we make sense of that? So what I want to propose is that we can make sense of both of those. And, and uh, I'd be interested to hear what you think about this, Mike. Uh, but, um, but I'm just saying either way, worst case scenario, I think, I think Paul comes off um, still looking completely logical, uh, hermeneutically speaking uh, here for sure. So, so here, here's sort of my solution sort of the method of how I'm approaching this is I want to propose two things. Number one, that Paul is reading these Old Testament passages or this Old Testament passage in a storied sort of way. Okay, in light of the messianic profile, we've talked a lot about that. So Paul's doing that, but he's also doing something else. Number two, he reads the Old Testament passage in light of what he believes about Jesus of Nazareth, namely that he is the Messiah, that he's the crucified and resurrected Messiah. Okay, that's important. So let's let's look at those two things. How how is he reading it in light of the storied uh, uh, messianic profile sort of way, and and how do, how would that help us make sense of this? Okay, so here's here's what we're gonna do. Let's look at that question. Okay, so it it really at this point in our series it sh it shouldn't be surprising at all that Paul would interpret a Davidic psalm christologically or mess messianically. After all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I mean, that that's our first obvious thing. If we, if we, you know, yeah, his justification remember. is his Christology. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's right. I mean, it just shouldn't be surprising that when he reads a Davidic Psalm that he's going to think Messiah. Why is that? Because we've traced in previous episodes, yeah, the Messianic the new profile. David. That's how, that's how Romans opens, you know? That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, it does. Romans one, three. Uh, that he's the offspring of David. So remember that one of those those core motifs of that messianic profile was a Davidic sonship, right? I mean, that was that's all over the place. Okay, so let's not be too surprised that Paul is doing what he's doing with this David text. Okay, and it also shouldn't be surprising that this text in particular, which spoke of David bearing reproaches from sinful people, it shouldn't be surprising that he would take that passage 
and apply it to Christ, because remember, the messianic profile was that of a servant. And if we recall from Isaiah, a suffering servant. And we, we've already seen, too, in past episodes that Paul places Jesus into the role of Isaiah's servant whenever he writes, you know, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, the Christ hymn, where, where Christ is called a servant. And so just those two things, I mean, Paul is doing something very consistent with the messianic profile. He's not doing anything too weird at all, actually. And so we've also seen how David language and servant language merge from time to time in the Old Testament. That was part of the Messianic profile. So again, we shouldn't be surprised to see uh, this idea of, of you know, Jesus bearing reproaches uh, in light of a Davidic text. Because servant, you know, this idea of a suffering servant and, and David language, they, they come together quite well in light of the profile that we've crafted. So here's what I'm going to conclude on this part. Because I think, I think Paul is just simply a good Jew who knew the Jewish story. And uh, that's why it's not surprising to see him read texts like this in light of mes- uh, his Messiah, his beliefs in the Messiah and in the Messianic profile. I think, I think Paul's interpretations do not make sense if we abstract him from the Jewish story, from the Jewish background. Um, but when we place him within that world, that Jewish background world, then his interpretations, I think, make make pretty good sense. Um, but, okay, so, but there's also a little bit more going on. I, I think Paul is doing more than reading Psalm 69 in light of the Messianic profile or in light of the Messianic story. He's doing that, but he's also reading it in light of what he believes about the historical person known as Jesus of Nazareth, and particularly in light of Jesus' death and resurrection. So for Paul, Jesus' death and resurrection, they, they provide what we talked about, that retrospective understanding of the text. It, it's not, okay, so here's, here's what I would say. It's not enough for Paul to read this text in light of the Old Testament's Messianic profile. He needs someone to fit that profile as well. And, and as it turns out, that's what he has in Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, who was resurrected. And so, so we have to recognize that this element is in place, and it helps us make sense of Paul's interpretation. Um, but, but, but our question still remains, right? How could Paul use this psalm to speak of Jesus when, in fact, that psalm assumes that the speaker is foolish and sinful? So, so I, I want to focus in on that question. So let's, let's look deeper at Paul's Christology. So in the greater context of Romans, and, and as well as in his other letters, I think it's clear that Paul places a lot of emphasis on the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, that that's, goes without saying. So, for example, Paul presents Jesus as someone being without sin. So think of 2 Corinthians 5.21. Um, he, Jesus knew no sin. He also presents Jesus as the son of David. And that's uh, something you mentioned a, go, a while ago, Mike, uh, from Romans 1.3. So for Paul, Jesus is without sin and he's the son of David. And that means that he is the ideal son of David, the, 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 the perfect son of David. Um, and I think that's an important point that we can make because, okay, in one sense, Paul doesn't need all of Psalm 69 to line up with Jesus because Jesus is a better David. I mean, that's his assumption, I think. And so for Paul, it, it doesn't matter that the original speaker of Psalm 69 was sinful and foolish. He, he can still, he can selectively draw from other parts of that Psalm to make his point about Jesus because he believes Jesus is to is the ideal Davidic king. Yeah. The better David. This is the better this is the better David. So what would we expect? Right. Well I think I, I think we would expect this, you know, by quoting that particular psalm in the way that he does is that Paul actually highlights the contrast between Jesus' sinlessness and David's sinfulness, right? Yeah. And 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 that doesn't work against Paul's interpretation. I mean, I think if anything, it reinforces his fundamental assumptions that, about Jesus, that he's the better Davidic king, the one we've all longed for, right? So, okay. Well, and it, once, it, also, yeah. it also reintroduces the, the, the whole humility aspect of this, you know, where Jesus was willing to be reproached. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was. And, and, um, and, and, and voluntarily willing to, to play, the, play the role of a servant as well, for sure. That's part of, that's part of the messianic assumptions and profile that Paul shares with the Old Testament, for sure. So, I mean, I think, I think in one sense then, and Jesus, 
you know, for Paul, Jesus is a resurrected son of David, a, a new version, a better version, the Old Testament's intended version. Okay, so so that that might make sense of why he he selectively does this. You know, if we just say, well, Paul doesn't want all of the text to be applied to Jesus. Okay, well, here's our justification. It doesn't have to be all applied to Jesus because Jesus is the better David. We we actually need a contrast between the original David and this this new resurrected David. But okay, but it, it's possible, and, and I I tend to think it's likely that maybe Paul envisioned Jesus owning even that part of the psalm that speaks of the sinfulness and the and the foolishness of David. Okay, so how how would that work? Well, I think it's because of what. Paul believes about what happened to Jesus on the cross. So if you look at other letters that Paul wrote, you look at a place like 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, where Paul talks about the cross as a as a display of power, but he also says that it also looked qu- quite foolish and like folly. It's, it, the cross is folly and foolishness to some people. And, you know, that's an interesting thing because, okay, maybe maybe Jesus can, in a sense, be applied back to those Psalm 69 texts that speak of David's folly and his foolishness because, well, Jesus carries that stuff for David and for all of us, right? So maybe in a sense, um, we can interpret it like that. Um, the other thing we see from Paul's letter to 2 Corinthians is that that the cross made Jesus look like he was crucified in weakness, but of course he lives by the power of God. So 2 Corinthians 13.4 so the cross shows Jesus to be pretty weak. I mean, it's in his weakness that he dies. Um, he hands himself over to death. Um, the cross even made Jesus look like a criminal, like someone sinful. You know, he who knew no sin became sin for us, right? Second Corinthians 5.21 again. And so so in, in one way, maybe those texts that speak of David's sinfulness um, can be applied to Jesus uh, in, in this manner, because the Messiah is the one who carries our folly, our sin, and then he'll carry David's too. So, so yeah, maybe you have that going on. But my point is this, either way, either way, Paul's interpretation, his Christological interpretation of Psalm 69 makes sense, no matter how we, how we choose to go. If, if we just say Paul can selectively do what he's doing, or if Paul intends the whole of Psalm 69 to apply to Jesus, I think there are there are hermeneutical ways to to get around that, and so the point again, the overall point is pretty simple: is that Paul interprets text in light of the messianic profile, but he also interprets text in light of what he believes about the death and the resurrection of Jesus, who is the Messiah, the Christ. So, uh, so you have you have those two aspects at play. It's almost as if the Old Testament's messianic profile and Paul's assumptions about Jesus of Nazareth that he experienced on the Damascus Road, Damascus Road, it's almost like as if they complement each other, they come together, and the result is his fresh understanding of, of the Old Testament text. So, I mean, that's my way of, of, of looking at this, and I, I think it works, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I... I, I th- I think either one of those, like you laid out, is is certainly possible because, you know, what what, what you don't have is you don't you don't have all of those thoughts extending directly from somewhere in Romans, but you do have them extending from somewhere else in Paul. Paul does say all those things. Right. So, I mean, it's it's certainly fair, you know, to to bring them to bear in this, you know, in in a passage like this. Right. Yeah. Because because I'm very interested in Paul's assumptions. Like I'm I'm very interested in the way in which he read text. Because if Jesus is the sin bearer, Paul doesn't need to be shy about him bearing sin. Right. <laughs> Ex- exactly. You know yeah. why why would he why would he be shy about that point if if, if that's part of the servanthood? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, taking the reproaches, then it, it is, and then he can use the the psalm that way. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's perfectly legitimate. It's hermeneutically viable. There's nothing weird or illogical about it. W- once you have those two things at play, you have his Christology as sort of an assumption that he brings to the text, but but you have to have his messianism, the messianic profile that comes from the text, right? And and perhaps it makes sense to to see it like this that the messianic profile provides categories or um Yeah. Things things that can be filled in with his assumptions about Jesus, 
Um, and th- th- that's the way they, they kind of interlock and they're mutually interpretive. So, so in my book, I, I say that the Old Testament text is the answer to Paul's questions about Jesus of Nazareth, the historical person. But it works the other way around, too. Jesus of Nazareth, the historical person, is the answer to the question of the Old Testament messianic text. They go together. It's question and answer. Both pose questions and give answers to the other. Paul's assumptions and Paul and, and the Old Testament's messianic profile, they interlock. They come together. I think the category, you know, categories is a good way to look at it. Yeah. It helps me you know, to conceptualize it like that. Well, we, we've used words like elements before. That's all, we're, that's all we're really talking about. Yeah, right. Or motifs or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the idea of a story, too, is, you know, the story continues in Jesus. And so what that, what that means is that exactly what Paul says in Romans 10, 4, that Christ, or again, Christos, uh, Mashiach, the Messiah, he is the telos, the culmination of the Torah. In other words, he's he's the culmination of this long-standing story that you know that that has been going on for a long time that is completed in Christ. And and you you need Christ to make sense of the story, but you need the story to make sense of the resurrected Christ. It's they they go together, you know, quite well. And and again, I keep coming back to something you said on social media. I think I mentioned this a few episodes ago, but I just love the way you you put it is that we we need, you know, how did you say it? you said our Christocentric reading of scripture shouldn't be an excuse to overwrite the original context of scripture or to contradict the original context or something like that. And and I love that because you know when I saw that I'm, I'm like man that's ex- that's exactly what I'm trying to say is is that Paul's Christology, you know, his Damascus Road experience or whatever uh, um that you know, is the way he read the Old Testament scriptures, but he doesn't do violence to the Old Testament scriptures by contradicting them or anything. He just completes them. And, and the two can go hand in hand together. So, um, yeah. So hopefully, um, you know, the, this series of episodes show how that works. We, we've we've kind of looked at the mechanics of it all, right? You know, how does it work in, in the level of detail? And, and hopefully this is helpful to a lot of, a lot of the audience and, and the people thinking through these issues. Later in Romans 15, Paul quotes the Old Testament really rapid fire in verses 8 through 13. Do we want to say anything about that? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, it, it would round off the discussion, I think, really well, because it, this is the way Paul follows up all the stuff that we've been talking about a moment ago. Um, so, yeah, let me, let me read Romans 15, verse 8 to 13 from the ESV. It says, Paul says this, he says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written in Psalm 18, uh, 49, uh, therefore I will praise you. Uh, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said in Deuteronomy 32, 34, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, in Psalm 116, verse 1, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10 says, the root of Jesse will come, and even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So, yeah, like you said, it's, it's rapid fire kind of stuff. Is that first Psalm reference, was that Septuagint or is that Masoretic text? Oh, yeah, this is going to be the MT. Uh, that's from the that's Psalm just, 1849. Yeah, yeah, that's, just for, that's from the Just ESP. for listeners' sake. Right, yeah, that's that's a good point. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's, is it It would be Psalm 17 in the Septuagint. But anyway. Yeah, so so he he's he's throwing out these rapid fire texts here, but it, it's actually a really important text because it, it's sort of the theological underpinning or the or the way Paul understands the ethics of of how Christians should should um, relate to one another. Um, because it, notice he said in that text in verse eight, he said that Christ became a what a servant, a servant. There's our language again, a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness, to confirm the promises given to the patriarch. Now, that that idea of, of Christ being a servant, 
is important. It's, it's diakonos in, in the Greek. And, uh, of course, servant is a loaded, loaded term in the Messianic profile. But the point is, is that by, uh, by coming and showing up, by being crucified and resurrected, Christ has actually fulfilled the Old Testament promises, the covenants and all of that. So, so this is important for us in light of our series because Paul does not think that Christ or his Christology contradicts the Old Testament covenant promises, right? He fulfills them. He confirms them, right? That's, uh, that's it, very important. It seems like it's, it's almost a necessity. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he's, almost, he's almost putting it out to the Jews that, look, your own scriptures say that the Gentiles are going to become worshipers of Yahweh. Mm-hmm. And, and here's the means to do so. Why would you deny that? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it's followed up with that that psalm uh, where he, it says, "I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name." And so um, the idea here is that Paul wants to show that the Gentiles they're brought in into this covenant family in a sense to bring praise to God for the mercy that they've been shown. And so he evokes a psalm and brings a psalm in to um, to complement this idea of, of Gentiles coming in and singing the praises of God, which is a very important theme in the Old Testament, not least with respect to Genesis 12, where Abraham is called in the first place. You know, Abraham is the patriarch, right? Um, Genesis 12, he's called, his family is yep. called to be the blessing to the nations and to restore the nations. And, and so Paul is bringing the psalm in to link up with that. Um, it takes it, you back to Malachi too. You know, Israel yeah. fails her election, her elective vocation, but Christ succeeds. Mm-hmm. Right. That's exactly right. And it, 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 all of this is Christological. Like God is confirming all this through Christ. That's how he starts off in verse eight. It's always through Christ. So, uh, yeah. So then you have um, another little text here. Rejoice, O Gentiles, uh, with his people. This comes from. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, and um, and it, it's an interesting text in 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 many respects, but uh, there's some differences here between the Septuagint and and the the MT, as I recall. But nonetheless, Paul is importing some of this back back to feed into the whole Jew Gentile idea and how it it all of it is confirmation of the promises of God uh, promises of God to the patriarchs. Because again, we have to remember that the patriarchs such as Abraham. He was promised that that the Gentiles, you know, would be blessed through him. And this is what Paul is envisioning at the end of his letter. Um, and then again, you have the, the Isaiah text, is it Isaiah 11. The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, and him will the Gentiles hope. Lots to be said about all of these texts here, but in perhaps much more detail. But again, the point in terms of the way Paul presents them is that he is viewing Jesus, obviously, as the long promised root of Jesse who has come, who's confirmed the promises to Abraham, but he's also brought in the Gentiles as well. Uh, and so, and then that, this ends with a blessing, of course, that the God of hope fill you all with joy, peace and believing so that through the Holy spirit, you might have hope. Um, he, again, he wraps it up. He wants the church to, uh, to be unified uh, and, and to interpret themselves as being part of this long awaited fulfillment uh, that they that, that Jew and Gentile could once again you know come together in unity. It's through it's through the Holy Spirit. And again, I love how he mentions the Holy Spirit here because you know with Pentecost, you know the nations are gathered and the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and you have the reversal of Babel. Everybody can understand each other again, right? So you know we haven't talked much about the Spirit in Paul's theology, but but it is uh, he is very important to Paul's conception of 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 all of this for sure. Yeah, at, at the very least, you you wouldn't you wouldn't get to the end of the letter here and and justify disunity or, or or lend any credence to it. I mean, this is what Paul's been angling for the whole time. Yeah. Uh, so. And, and he's uh, saying that this is what the text, the Old Testament, has been angling for the whole time too, because he says yeah. in verse eight, this all of this confirms the promises to the patriarchs. Yeah. Yeah. So so let 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 the scripture be fulfilled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get out of its written. way. That's right. That's right. Uh huh. It's it's all so important for Paul. Paul again in my book. I start off with saying it. Paul respects the Old Testament. You know, contrary to what we may think. I mean, he he respects it. And and again, contrary to you know maybe some of our modern assumptions and some of our commitments to an overt literalism originist of biblical interpretation. Okay. 
Paul or, can do some or, fresh things with critics. the tech suit. Yeah, or critics. That's right. Yeah. Paul's still doing some fresh things with the new. I mean, I admit that, you know, I, I said that before is I, I just want to be that kind of that referee. I just want to say, OK, here's what Paul's doing. Let's admit it. And over here, here's what Paul is doing. Let's admit that. But where do, where do we get? And we do get radical freshness and, and newness in Paul's interpretations. But there's a logic to it. He's not a textual relativist. You know, he's not someone he's who thinks not, the, he's not just making stuff up. No, nope. because, it, yeah, well, this will sound good. No, he has to tie it somewhere. Right. Yeah. He has a high view of scripture. I, I firmly believe that. Well, thanks again for being with us, Matt. I mean, I think this is a good way to end our our series. Again, just with some of the, the things that Paul was hoping would come out of this practically, you know, for the Romans and you know, obviously for us as readers as well. It's, it's certainly applicable. So thanks again for spending your time with us and you know for the work you put into this. Yeah, thanks again, Mike, uh, and, and to your audience for for allowing me to be on uh, uh, the, in the series and talking about my passion and and, and I, I love scripture. I know you love scripture, and it's it's been great chatting with you uh, about this topic. So thanks again. All right, Mike. Well, it's sad that we're wrapping up this particular series, but it's been a good one. The payoff was good. It was a great series. Yeah, yeah. I think it. I think this is one that. You know, it, it, it might, on, on the surface of it, you know, especially if people try to jump in somewhere in the middle, which, again, we we would certainly advise against that. This is going to be one of those series that you have to go back to the beginning to appreciate. And if you do, I think people, the more people do that, the more they'll see the importance of it. I mean, I envision a class somewhere in seminary or, or somewhere in Bible college teaching this, maybe. I don't know, Mike. Yeah. Uh, Maybe they'll use no, I, I, the episodes that's for, true. For, for the class material. Who knows? But it was that kind of quality. And uh, again, be looking for Dr. Matt Halstead's book, which should be out, I guess, any week now. Yeah, have a look out on Amazon, and you can either order or pre-order. All right, Mike. Well, I guess we're going to do some Q&As, and then yep. um, over the horizon will be the uh, – Walton series, the demons series, I believe. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's, that's not going to be terribly long, uh, in, in terms of a series, but yeah, that, that is over the horizon. Okay. Well, good deal. All righty. Well, we certainly enjoyed it and we want to thank Dr. Matt Halstead for uh, joining us and, uh, want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.